today we're talking about spiritual health and wellness. The question I want to ask you is a very simple one. What's the best way to keep the doctor away? Thank you, Ron. An apple. Take an apple a day, the old saying says, and it will keep the doctor away. I like to go back and look at where uh, things, sayings come from. You know, we say things for a reason. They come from somewhere in history. Why? Why do we say them? Well, the, the saying about keeping a doctor, you know, even eating an apple a day keeps the doctor away. We can date it back to about 1913, the first time it was put in publication uh, in a magazine. Uh, it, was, it was written uh, based off of an old Scottish proverb that dates back to 1866 in a magazine called Notes and Quarries. The original phrase was published. Here was the original phrase. Eat an apple on going to bed and you'll keep the doctor from earning his bread. <laughs> now, I, in all honesty and disclaimer here, I am a, an employee of the hospital. I'm not trying to run you away from our local doctors or hospital. Uh, I do need to keep my job, my wife says. She said I need to earn my keep. And so don't leave behind Coosa Valley Medical Center and don't forget our doctors. Um, I wish it worked the way the saying said. I wish that just simply eating an apple every day would do uh, just that. I, I wish it would keep us healthy and I wish it would make us uh, well at all times. But in truth, it, it really doesn't work that way. Um, but here's something I can say with confidence to you. If we desire better overall health benefits, there are numerous studies that indicate that a strong spiritual life and regular church attendance actually make a difference in our overall health. Um, what does that say? It says that our faith makes a difference to us. Now, that's not just me saying that. Um, of all places, Harvard University, one of the professors there, uh, in a public health article not long ago, talked about the benefits of regular church attendance, faith, and how it plays out in health care. The professor's name is Dr. Tyler Vander Wheeling. Now, that's a good name for you right there. He is the professor of ep epidemiology. That's another word I struggle with. At Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And he said that what we find in society today is that so many medical articles and so many medical textbooks and training books for would-be doctors leave out what faith means and what faith, what difference it makes in our life. And this professor at Harvard said that, that is absolutely a shame and it is wrong that we don't allow the faith base, the faith part to play out in our spirituality and our health care. I'm also shocked that he, he disagreed with those people who said there's just not enough research or there's not enough information out there about it. Notice what he said. Here's what he said about faith. He said faith makes a difference. It lowers our mortality rate. It lowers depression. There's less suicide, better cardiovascular disease survival, better health benefits, and greater mental stability, happiness, and purpose in life. Now, that's pretty impressive from a Harvard professor, wouldn't you think? Um, he also went uh, there with another professor uh, from Harvard. His name is Dr. Howard Cole. Um, he is the uh, Harvey Feinberg Professor of Practice of Public Health Leadership at Harvard. And he said that if we integrate spirituality and care, it can help each person have a better chance of reaching complete wellness and their highest obtain obtainable standard of health. I like that. They say that if we want to be as healthy as we can be, our faith plays a role in that, and it plays an important role in that. But the sad reality today is that, that many of us, many Americans, are not taking advantage of their faith. They're not living out their faith. Years ago, we would have said that more and more people went to church, more and more people were people of faith, and yet today, as Americans, that is declining. Less people go to church week by week than what they used to. The studies show that today, that only 31%, well, 31% 31 of Americans say they never attend church. You realize that's a third of the people in our nation say they never go to church. And only 21% of people say they go to church every Sunday. 
So in our society today, we're seeing less and less people take advantage of the faith and the spirituality that can make a huge impact on our lives. Now, out of the, out of the, the people who do go, uh, Protestants attend church more faithfully than any other denominational or organizational group. Protestants do. But out of the Protestants who go to church, only 30% of Protestants say they are at church each week, and only 14% say they are there almost every week. So what am I trying to say? The studies show, the Harvard studies have shown, that the spirituality, that faith, that church attendance makes a huge impact, and yet we as Americans do not take advantage and we do not go to church the way we once did. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not telling you to go to church to stay healthy. You did not hear that come out of my mouth today. I'm not telling you that the only reason to go to church is your health benefit. Now, there are health benefits if you go, but I'm not telling you that's the only reason. If you are a Christian, if you're a believer in Christ, I would tell you you go because you want to learn more about him, you want to fellowship with other believers, and you want to learn God's word. That's why we go to church, not necessarily to stay healthy. But if we need some additional ammunition, there it is. Health care says that the research says, the information says, that going to church and being faithful to God does make a difference in our health. Dr. Vander Wheely also said, he said, when you look at the data we have on religious participation in health, it seems reasonable to encourage those who already identify with a religious tradition to participate in communal religious life. In other words, he would say, I want to encourage people to keep going. And then he says, health officials ignoring this data mean they're neglecting an important health resource and will be leaving the population in poor health. In other words, if healthcare professionals say that faith plays no role, then they are not serving their patients as well as they should. Now, Dr. Vanderwilly also said, it is time for the neglect of religion and public health conversations to change. He would encourage people to talk about it with their physician. So what is it going to take for us to see the value of faith? What is it going to take for us to understand the value that faith has on our wellness and health care? Does it really matter? Yeah. 41% of patients want to discuss religious or spiritual concerns with, within the healthcare settings. People want to talk about how does this medicine, how does this treatment, how does this um, therapy, how does it relate to my faith? What impact does it have? 41% want to talk about it. And yet, in our country today, less than 50% of all people surveyed said they had the opportunity in their health care setting to have spiritual support available. What does that mean? Less than 50% of most hospitals provide chaplain services and spiritual support within their hospital um, campus. So 41% say they want it. 50% say that it's not available to them. So I want to say to you today that we have gone a long ways, not in the positive, but in the negative. Back in ancient days in healthcare, the mental and physical were right alongside the spiritual. And all three played a factor. And I still believe today as a minister, as a chaplain at the hospital, I still believe today that our faith makes a difference in how well we get and how quickly uh, we heal. A survey was done of 9,000 people. They asked them, did it make a difference if you had spiritual support when you were in the hospital? The vast majority of people said, yes, it makes a difference with my overall care. Now, that's just not me speaking um, there's a group called Press Ganey, uh, which they are one of the largest, most widely used patient satisfaction groups in America. Press Ganey and then the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services said they found that patients that have a chaplain visit and spiritual support are significantly more likely to say that the staff at the hospital address their, em their emotional needs. Now, I realize when I say that, that people do want their spiritual needs addressed when they're in the hospital. There would be some who would say, well, maybe, chaplain, what we should do is just leave that to the doctors. 
Well, that same group, Press Ganey that I mentioned ago, also surveyed doctors. And 75% of the doctors that they surveyed and talked with about doctors providing spiritual care to their patients, 75% of them said this, I don't have enough time during the medical encounter with the patient to deal with the spiritual. Now, let me put this in perspective. You go to the doctor in the clinic, and you wait for what seems like an eternity. I, I know, I do too. I don't like it any more than you do when I have to wait. And then we go in and it feels like the doctor comes in and in about 10 seconds, he or she's gone. Now that's not reality. We don't wait for three hours always. Occasionally we do have to wait if the doctor's having an emergency. And the doctor does spend more time with us than the 10 seconds that we think. But doctors simply say that their most important Thing, their most important discussion in the time they have with you and me is our medical condition to get you well physically. So they say they don't have the time to add to that the spiritual component and what's involved in the spiritual part. Now the same group said not only do doctors say they don't have the time, they said secondly that they don't have the adequate training to provide spiritual care to patients. I am not a medical doctor. If you rely on me to get you well, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Okay? I'm just going to tell you, we can go ahead and call the funeral home because I, I'm not going to be able to solve problems for you. I'm not a medical doctor. Doctors will tell you they're not the chaplain as well. You see, chaplains in hospitals are a little bit different than pastors who come and visit in the hospital. I was a pastor for about 20 years. But chaplains are different and have additional training that pastors do not. Most hospitals in the United States require additional training for chaplains. Most hospitals require that a chaplain have a master's degree in theology or in pastoral care and counseling. Most hospitals require chaplains to have clinical pastoral education, which is above and beyond what you receive in a college training. Most hospitals require the, the church or denominational endorsement of the chaplain. Most hospitals require you to continue additional training to be a chaplain. So it's not just the spiritual part that a chaplain provides. There's a lot of training that goes into it that doctors and nurses simply don't have. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. But I am the chaplain and provide something to our team that they do not. So doctors say they don't have time. Number two, they don't have training. The third thing that they will say is that they're not comfortable engaging people who are of a different faith than them. They're not trained in dealing with the different faith practices in a given community. And so they're often not comfortable talking with people from a different faith. Then also, a significant number of doctors felt that it was not the doctor's role to have these conversations with patients. I'm very thankful that at Coosa Valley Medical Center, I'm part of the medical team, uh, part of the team of doctors and nurses and technicians and, and staff that we have. We regularly dialogue <coughs> with one another about the needs of the patient. They come and they talk with me, consult with me about my patient is struggling with this part of their faith, or they're struggling with depression or anxiety, whatever it might be. And then on, in vice versa, I have the opportunity as chaplain to go and share with the doctor, your patient says they are concerned about this part of their, their treatment, or they're concerned about this medication. So we work together as a team to provide the very best health care coverage that we can uh, to those who trust us as, um, as their patient. That's why I'm so proud to, to be at Coosa Valley. You know, I said to you a minute ago that 50% of people that go into the hospital setting say, I don't have a chaplain. We don't have spiritual support at our hospital. Our hospital has believed in that forever. The previous chaplain was there well over 25 years. I'm coming up on two year anniversary at the hospital. We believe in, in spiritual support. You've probably seen, I know you've heard, and, and I think it's appropriate though to repeat it again today. Here's our mission statement at the hospital. Coosa Valley Medical Center is dedicated to providing our community with comprehensive health services 
that enhance the health and wholeness of each individual we serve through medical and spiritual support while affirming their personal value and dignity. If you'll notice, I've counted, you didn't count. There's 37 words in that mission statement. And out of those 37 words, there's the word services, the word serve, and the word spiritual support. You see a theme that's developing there. The idea is that our hospital is there to serve you and to take care of the needs that you present. So we service you, we serve you, and we provide spiritual care to you when you come to our hospital. <coughs> Why? Well, I, I dare say that most people don't come to the hospital because everything's great and wonderful. Now, I know some of you come and eat lunch at the hospital every day. I got that. And that's great and wonderful. But most of the time when people come to our hospital, it's because they have a, they have a need. They have an emergency. They have an emergent situation that needs to be, that needs to be dealt with. There are those big things that come up in life, and you're looking for answers. The University of Maryland Medical Center said we oftentimes face these big questions. Why has this happened? And then to make it even more specific, why is it happening to me? I don't care about who's in room 279. I care about me. I'm in room 277. Why is it happening to me? What does it all mean? You know, what does this mean for my future health? What does it mean for my future well-being? How do I make sense of everything? You ever ask that question? How do you make sense of it? You know, the doctors told me that I have a form of cancer and it has spread from here to another part of my body. How do I make sense of that? How do I feel about the changes in my life? Well, the older I get, the less I like the changes taking place. <laughs> What gives me comfort and hope is not, it's not getting out of the bed in the morning and feeling sore from head to toe. It's not the health concerns that I have. So what brings me comfort? What do I call good in my life? What do I call bad? What am I grateful for? Who do I trust? What do I trust? Who loves me and is loved by me no matter what? Who or what beyond myself do I believe is the most important thing in my life? You see, these are those big, big questions that we oftentimes struggle with and, and we, try to, we try to find the answers to them. I hope you notice as I went through all those questions, almost all of them relate to something related to spiritual, to our faith, to our health care is related to how we value God. So what do we do? What do we as a hospital do about that? Well, I'm going to tell you very simply, just like I hope when you go to your doctor, you know that he or she does not have just one medical plan for you. You know, the patient right before you and the patient after you is not going to get the same treatment and care and medicine and evaluation. Well, when you come in as your chaplain, I'm going to treat you as a unique individual and not have just one plan on how you should be taken care of. But there are some things I do for every patient that I want to share with you that will help you and me in our spiritual uh, wellness. The first thing that I would say is that as your chaplain, I always try to take my cues from you as the patient. Um, at Cusa Valley, you'll hear us talk. I, I, I had the opportunity this morning, we had a, a group of 11 new employees at the hospital. And every Monday when we do that, uh, I go in and talk with them. And uh, I said to them today, I said, one thing I want you to always remember Coosa Valley, and it's, it, it's not drilled into us, but it said a whole lot. And that is that you are a guest when you come there. You really are our guest. And we want to treat you with the respect that you're due. There's a lot of places you can go for health care, but we're so thankful you come to Coosa Valley. So when you come in, we're going to treat you as our guest and we're going to try to honor what's unique about you. So when I go see you in a hospital room, I'm going to let you take the lead in what we talk about. Now, this is going to sound strange to some of you, so please listen to me, hear me out what I'm about to say. When I walk into a patient's room, the first thing I talk about is not religion and what church you go to. Usually the first questions that I will ask a patient is, how are you feeling today? Or I'll ask them, what brought you into the hospital? 
because you're going to tell me what you really need to talk about and what's on your heart and what's concerning you in the moment. You may want to talk about your church and your pastor or your minister or your elder, whoever is the leader in your church. You may want to talk about something entirely different with me. And if I come in with that one size fits all, I'm not going to hear what you most have upon your heart. And so as your chaplain, I'm always going to try to take my cues from what it is that you have on your mind. The second thing is that my goal is, is just to demonstrate a Christ-like attitude toward you. This is going to sound really simplistic. I don't mean for it to, and it's going to sound almost self-serving. I don't mean for it to, but I honestly, when you, when I walk into your room at the hospital, I just want to love you the way God loves you. Nothing more, nothing less than that. Uh, that is my goal. That's my hope that I can just love on you. I want to love you the way I would want somebody to take care of my wife or my children and just be your friend. Now, I wish I could tell you that all the patients love back on me the same way. <laughs> I have been cussed at. Uh, I have been screamed at. Uh, I have been swung at. I was quicker than they were. And this morning, I had a patient who put a curse on me. <laughs> so I can't say that, um, you know, all people treat me that way. But my goal is, no matter how I'm treated, is just to love you like God loves you. And I'll say this to you. I know a lot of our nurses and doctors and techs at the hospital, those specialists that take care of you, a lot of them have this same goal in mind. They want to love on you the way God loves you too. Next is, I always ask patients how I can support them spiritually. This part is really, this part is really pretty simple. Um, you know, if I walk into a patient's room, the, the most common thing I hear when I walk into a patient's room is that beeping and banging and bumping and noise that's coming off that IV machine. You know what I'm talking about? And it drives me crazy. Now I don't even hear it anymore after I've been there so long in the hospital, I don't usually hear it. And so when I walk into a patient's room, I'll always ask them, what can I do to serve you? How can I help you? And if their machine is beeping and going off, they'll use to say, Chaplain, could you get the nurse to come look at my machine? And so when I leave the patient's room, you know what I do? I go to the nurse's station, I find their nurses assigned to them or the aide, and I say, would you mind going down to room number 275 and work on their machine real quick? At times I'll go to a patient's room and they'll say, Chaplain, there's not a Bible in my room. When I leave their room, I go to my office, I have a supply of Bibles that are provided to us by the Gideon organization, and uh, I go to my office and get a Bible and I take it back to their room. Sometimes when I go see a patient, they're getting ready for surgery to the next day or maybe later that day, and they'll say, my pastor doesn't know I'm here, my minister doesn't know I'm here, would you call him or her and let them know that I'm in the hospital? And I'll go to a private area and I'll call their minister and say, can you come? Now, when I leave that patient's room, I never make a promise I can't keep to them. Never. If I walk out and say, I'll go ask the nurse, I can keep that promise. I will go ask the nurse if they can come check the machine. But that nurse may very well in that moment be taking care of an emergency down the hallway that nobody knows anything about. I may call the pastor and the pastor may say, chaplain, I'm sick or I'm on vacation and I'm halfway across the country. I can't be there. So I go back every time, whether I, what I find out from the nurse or what I find out from their pastor, I always go back and say, let me tell you what I found out. What can I do to make it better for you? And instead of their pastor coming, many times they'll ask me, would you pray for me? And so I'll stop and pray. So part of service and spiritual support is doing very practical things, even helping with them to make sure their machine is not beeping any longer or to make sure their pastor knows that they are in the hospital. The next thing is we support patients within their own faith tradition. My job is providing spiritual care. It's not to convert you to my faith. That's not my job. 
My responsibility is to connect people with God if that's what they want. Now, I remember when you come into the hospital, you're a pretty captive audience. Many times you're laying in bed or you're sitting in those very comfortable chairs right there beside the bed, right? And you're a captive audience. You can't go anywhere. You can't run away. You're stuck. Well, it would be very easy to take advantage of that and say, you ought to believe the way I believe and this wouldn't be happening to you. I can't do that. I have to respect you on where you are and your relationship with God and then what you want from me as far as my faith in God and God's love for me. People don't convert people. Only God handles changes in people's lives. And so my job is to connect you to God as I possibly can. Next is to listen to the fears and concerns without going into my own stuff. When I go into people's rooms, they will very honestly talk to me about what's going on. They'll tell me what's concerning them, what's hurting them. They'll tell me about their fears. And it's really easy to, for me to say, and it's easy for you to say, when they tell me all this stuff going on, it's easy to say, well, I know exactly how you feel. <laughs> nope. Nope. I can, and you can. We don't always know what somebody's feeling. Now, I can tell them stories from my own life, and I can talk about the things that uh, I've experienced, but they don't need that in that moment. They just need me to listen to them and to let them talk about what's concerning and what they are most fearful about. I do ask people if I can pray with them. If somebody is in distress, I'll pretty quickly we'll ask, can we pray before we even visit together? Or I'll say, Mrs. Jones, would you mind if I say a short prayer for you? Almost all, almost all patients say, yes, chaplain, please pray for them. I try to offer an encouraging word of thought to them. There's nothing like the word of God to lift people's spirits. Um, as appropriate, I'll share a Bible verse with them. You know, Psalm 46, verse 10 says, be still and know I am God. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, Cast all of our fears on him. 23rd Psalm begins, The Lord is my shepherd. And so there are tons of scriptures that we can use as we meet and as we talk and as we visit, and it does find comfort. But I don't just read the ones I want. Many times I'll say, What verse means the most to you? What would you like for me to share with you? And then sometimes... All that really matters is the gift of presence and touch. I'm going to confess something to you. When I was a young minister, I had a really bad habit, and I think most young pastors do. When I was in a situation and somebody was grieving and hurting, I thought I had to use a lot of words, and I had to talk a lot of Christian stuff and a lot of Bible stuff, and I just had to talk and talk and talk. But the older I've gotten, I've realized that sometimes all I really need to do is just be present in the room with them. And in that moment, as I'm being present with them, I'm being the hands and feet of God in that room. And I'm just being there with them. One of the greatest, one of the greatest healing tools is just touching somebody. I'm very careful with that. I would never want to be accused of doing anything improper. And so I will ask as I'm getting ready to pray, would it be okay if I hold your hand while we pray? Or may I place my hand on your shoulder while I pray for you? And sometimes just a gentle touch. I don't have a needle. I don't have a blood pressure cuff that's going to squeeze. I don't have a stethoscope that I'm listening to. But I can touch them like Jesus touched people in the Bible. That's what I need to do too. So what's my hope? These are just a few. My hope is that you'll have a shorter stay in the hospital. How many people like to go to the hospital and just stay for weeks and weeks and weeks? <laughs> Not many. I, I haven't to be honest. I've met some that don't want to leave. I got that. But my hope for you is that you come in and you're out as quick as you can be. Really is my hope. Secondly, that you have improved pain management. 
I don't like pain. I jokingly tell our nurses I'm allergic to pain and needles. And they look at me like, never heard anybody allergic to needles. Well, I'm really not, but if, you, if it'll help you stick me a lot less, I'm allergic to needles as well. I don't like pain. You don't either. And so I'm hoping that the power of God in that room with you as we talk will help with that. The improved experience of your stay, I want you to think of Coosa Valley as your home away from home. We're going to take good care of you. We're going to treat you like our guests. We're going to love on you when you come in. And then we're going to send you home so you can heal there. I also want you to complete the task. Uh, you gone through therapy lately? We had a physical therapist in our orientation this morning. I said, I don't like you very much. I don't even know you. And she looked at me. I said, you like to hurt people. Uh, I had shoulder surgery seven or eight years ago, and man, they put me through a war with her. But they did it for one reason. You know what it was? To get me better. And so if I can encourage you, I'm going to do that to get better by doing what they say. Improvement of your cardiovascular needs, heart rate and blood pressure. Um, improved sense of well-being, just feeling better overall. And then most importantly, that when you leave our hospital, you know you <laughs> had spiritual support and we treated you like our guest while you were there. Um, one last thing, as we're thinking about health care, some things you can do to, before you go into the hospital. Uh, Kaiser Permanente is a very large in, insurance corporation company, and they suggested that we think about these things as we think about faith and health care. Um, they said, what are you thankful for? I'm going to just encourage you today to take a piece of paper. Start a blank piece of paper. What am I most thankful for today? You know, think about that for just a minute. Uh, what are your sources for strength? Do you have a faith in God? Do you read the Bible? Do you pray? Do you have a strong family support? What is it that gives you strength on a day-to-day -day basis? What gives your life meaning? If you are fighting for your life, what would make it worth fighting for? Is it fighting for your children, your grandchildren? Is it fighting for your church? What would make your life better? What do you feel, feel fully alive when you do? What makes you get up in the morning and go? Is a relationship to a higher power or universal being important to you? Is it important for you to have faith? What life experiences are meaningful for you? Are there sacraments or rituals that are meaningful? Are there things like reading your Bible or going to church and taking communion or being baptized? Those kind of things. Do those things mean something to you? Is faith community important for you right now? And how is your community in general important? Those are things that you can be dealing with today while you're not in the hospital, while you're not at the doctor's office. Those are questions you can be asking. What will make a difference in my health care when I go to Coosa Valley? What's going to make it better? All right. That's enough of me talking. Do you want to ask any questions? Do you want to make any observations this afternoon about what I've said? Yes, Ron. I have two or couple of questions for you. Uh, what is your situation if you go in to see a patient and they are atheists? They have no religious belief at all that you encounter that. That's number one. And number two, your role in dealing in true emergency situations where someone is near death, a family you know, has come in, and your role in dealing with the family as well as Okay. If I don't get to the second one, remind me because my memory gets shorter every day. Uh, let me deal with the second one first. How about that? My role at the hospital is multifaceted. Um, I've been at the hospital over a year and a half now. The first year, and I told Vanessa, Vanessa's my supervisor, so I'll try to keep her happy if I can. Uh, but the first year that I was at the hospital, a large part of my goal was getting to know the staff and the people I work with and for them to trust me. You know, the previous chaplain had been there 25 plus years. They all knew him and, and how he worked. So they didn't know me from anybody. So I wanted them to know me. And so I, I spent a lot of time with that, but also being with patients. During the time of crisis, you'll hear at the hospital occasionally, there will be a code go out over the intercom system. But primarily, we don't use that just because we don't want to start on the hospital family, the patients. Uh, normally, I will get a call from the, uh, the nurse that's in that area and or the unit secretary, and they'll let me know there's an emergency. 
I'll use, let's just use the emergency room for example. Uh, whatever I'm doing, I, I will drop and go to that emergency because that's the most important thing in that moment. And uh, that's the understanding. When I came to Coosa Valley, I, I have a lot of speaking things to do and a lot of devotionals that I give on campus and a lot of other things I do than just outside of the patients. I said, so what do I do in case of, uh, of a crisis like that? And I'll never forget our CEO, Glenn Sis, said to me, Steve, you go. Don't worry about those other things. And I knew I could work for a hospital like that when the CEO said, you go take care of the emergency. Um, so what I do is I immediately go to the area, to the emergency room, if that's it. I go talk to the doctor and the nurse assigned and find out what the crisis is. Uh, I go back to what I said earlier, every situation is unique and different. So I need to know what I'm dealing with, uh, what dynamics they see. Was it something sudden or is it something that's been prolonged? So the more I know, the better I can help the family. Once I know those things, I go find the family, identify who they are you know, the spouse or the children or grandchildren, whoever it is, and then begin offering ministry to them, talking with them, praying with them, and going back to what I said, just being present with them, just sitting there and being available. Um, one of the things that I've learned in healthcare is very simply this, and I don't mean for it to sound terrible in any sense of the word, but when you come into a trauma situation in the hospital, the doctors and the nurses, their only concern is the patient. They forget about the family sometimes, or they put them out of their mind because they're focused on saving a life. My job then becomes the family. And so you'll see me, especially in the emergency room situation where I will be talking with the family, and then I'll go back and get an update from the doctor. I'll go back to the family and give them the update that the doctor wants them to have. And so I go back and forth in those trauma situations and as one of our doctors who told me last year, this doctor said, I never leave my patients when they're in a crisis. I never leave my patients when they're in crisis. And so if it's an hour or five, I'm going to stay with that family until they no longer need my help uh, as chaplain. So that's how I handle it. Uh, the emergency situations come first and foremost. Whether it's 10 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night, I'm available to be there and uh, help in those situations. First question, Ron, was dealing with someone that has no, no faith. faith. I, I, yeah, usually I don't run into people in our community. We're in the heart of the Bible Belt. Most people would, don't, wouldn't identify themselves as, as an atheist to me. Um, occasionally they have, and I say, look, that's fine. I just want to let you know I'm here. If I can do anything for you, I'm available to support. And ironically, many times later, they'll call and say, hey, would you get the chaplain for me? And I'll go back and talk. Um, a lot of times people with uh, some, some different um, theological backgrounds and denominational uh, issues will be concerned that I'm going to come in and try to convert them to, to whatever I believe. And what I said to you earlier, I don't do that. And so if I can identify those needs, then I will locate someone from their faith community that can help them come in. Uh, Ron and I shared, Ron's a volunteer at the hospital, so I know a little bit about Ron. Uh, we've shared a little bit. Uh, I'm not Roman Catholic, and so uh, there's certain uh, processes and elements of the Catholic Church that a member of the church wants that I'm not able to do for them. And so I have a wonderful relationship with the Catholic priest here in town, and uh, at the drop of a hat, he comes when we call to help us. And so that's part of what I do in situations. If they if they just reject the chaplain outright, that's fine. That's all they can. That's their freedom, right, to do it. Uh, but most time, they'll at least talk and visit and want to hear. You know, want to talk a little bit.